Isn't it wonderful to be able with confidence to say that we're in the glory land way? Realizing that the ultimate reward of our existence lies ahead of us and we are aware of that. We're not just living a life upon this earth, we're living for eternity in heaven. And that is a wonderful place to be to know I'm on that glory land way. Why is it glory land way? Because we're going to be glorified in heaven. We're going to have a glorified body. We're going to be surrounding the throne of a glorified God. It's the glory land way. And if we are not able to say that because we're not in Christ, we're not serving the Lord, we're not walking in that way, then I hope that you will soberly think about yourself tonight as we go to God's word. We've just sung that within thy sacred page, I seek thee, O Lord. My heart pants for thee, O living word. And that's the attitude that we should have about God's word. So when the preacher says, let's turn to Hebrews, the third, the third chapter, so that's where I want to go. I want to find out what God says about himself, not what man says. And that's what we're going to do this evening. And we ask the question from Hebrews 3, verse 15 to Hebrews 4 and verse 13. That's the ground we're covering this evening that God's rest remains. That's an argument that he makes, and he makes it from Scripture. The question is, will you enter into that rest? It remains. It's there. But will you enter into that rest? That's the question. And that's where we put ourselves into, and we're going to see who enters into that rest this evening. But I want you to notice why I'm taking that expansion of Scripture. What happens in Hebrews, the second chapter, and verse 17, he's speaking about Christ, that it behooved him to become like the people he serves, not angels, in order to be a merciful and faithful high priest. That's back in Hebrews 2 and verse 17. Then we have chapter 3. We've looked at that this morning. But then we pick up in chapter 4 and verse 17. 14, he seems to be picking up the theme again of high priest. He says, having then, having then a high priest who hath passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold fast our confession. He spoke about the high priesthood of Jesus. He's merciful, he's faithful. Then he takes us on a journey of application. Well, if he's our high priest, then we need to consider him as our confession and our the apostle and high priest of our confession. And then we spoke about this morning, the fact that we've got to hold firm to the end, our confession, so we can be connected with Christ. And there's another thing taking place four times in this section that we'll study this evening. You'll see that Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11, it's, they are talked about again. Some four times he hits Psalm 95, 7. Psalm 95, 7. And we talked about Psalm 95, 7 today. So while it's fresh upon our minds, I would like to take it to where the Holy Spirit takes it and the, in the Hebrew letter. These bookends of high priesthood, I know he picks up now the high priesthood again, but now he makes, wants us to make application. And this morning, are we going to hold fast our confession of hope firm to the end? That's from Psalm 95. And this Psalm 95, he's emphasizing there is a rest remaining. And the question is, will you enter in? So let's begin and understand that as he sees this rest remaining, let's establish that as we look here at Hebrews 4 and verse 1. Let us therefore, lest happily a promise be left of entering into his rest, that one should come short of it. It's a promise. Heaven is a promise. It's reserved in heaven for you, Peter says. Would it be sad if you don't make it? If you don't enter in? It's just a promise that's left. It's still out there, and that's what he's looking at. Now let's continue. Hebrews 4, verse 3 through 6. 
For we who believe enter into that rest, even as he has said, as I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter to my rest. No, it says, we who believe going to enter that rest, and then he hits Psalm 95 of those who don't. Then he comes back, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere of the seventh day on this wise, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, they shall not enter into my rest. Seeing therefore remaineth that some should enter in thereto, they to whom the glad tidings were before preached failed to enter in because of disobedience. All right, Jesus, God has already rested from creation. It was his Sabbath rest. He said he has said somewhere, you know where he says it, Genesis 2, 1 through 3, where he rested from his labors. He was contrasting those who believe and those who disobey and don't believe. But is the Sabbath rest, is that the rest that's out there? Well, he's already rested. Creation has, has ended. There's something else waiting out there that's called God's rest. It's not his Sabbath rest. And we who believe, as he brings it to the point here, we who believe are going to enter into that rest, but there's those who won't. Because of disobedience. And we don't want to be in that group. So here's this idea. Rest is still out there. Will you enter in? That's kind of the theme that we're talking about. And then he makes this point. In Hebrews 4, 7, and 8. He again defineth a certain day. Today. Saying in David. So long a time afterward. Even as he said before. Today. If he shall hear his voice. Harden not your hearts. Now this is where he makes the point. If Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken afterward of another day. There remaineth therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Who wrote Psalm 95 and verse 7? Hope you said the Holy Spirit inspired David to write it. Because that's what we saw this morning. Holy Spirit said, Psalm 95. But David here writes. Now the point he makes of David, the reason he goes to David and not the Holy Spirit, is not that he's saying the Holy Spirit didn't do it, David did. He's saying David came along in Psalm 95 and spoke about a rest that's remaining. And if Joshua had given rest to the people of Israel... What is that? Rest from their wandering? Rest in the land of Canaan? Then how come David, who came afterward, talks about another rest? We're beyond creation where God rested. That's not the rest we enter, though we're in it. <laughs> He's quit doing all his creation, which is a great point about evolution. It doesn't keep on going. He's finished. He brought everything to existence. Never was by evolution. But God's finished. And so it's not that rest. And it's not the rest that the children of Israel received in the land of Canaan. It's not that rest. Because David spoke about another rest after Joshua came along. Joshua brought them in the land of Canaan. You see the point? David spoke of something afterward called the rest of God that we are to enter. After the people had entered the land of Canaan. That theme, that point... That rest is still out there, dear Christian. And Psalm 95 is being used, let's don't fall short. Let's don't be like the people in the Old Testament. Let's don't be those people that will not enter into God's rest, that will continue to be under God's wrath. Let's be the people who enter the rest that is still out there for each one of us. So I want to investigate that with you with a few points. The lesson will be yours. Number one, who will enter into God's rest? Are those, the, those are the people who do more than just hear God's voice. Notice this point that we're observing in Hebrews, the third chapter. And we'll notice in verse 15, after we or to holding our comments firm to the end, he comes back to Psalm 95. While it is said, today if you shall hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. 
For who, when they heard, did provoke? For they provoked God. That's Psalm 95. They tested God. Exodus 17, 1 through 7. They strived against God. They, they said, well, is God among us or not? They're testing God. They're tempting God. Are you really there, God? And that's what Psalm 95 is referring back to. And what we see here, they all heard God's voice. But then who provoked? It's those people who heard the voice and didn't do more than that. What did they do? Well, let's continue. And with whom was he displeased for 40 years? Was it not them that sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? We can't take that land. And therefore those who were of age, 20 and above, who had that disbelief, they didn't go into that land. They all died in the wilderness. They sinned against God because they doubted God. But who else? And to whom swear he, verse 18, that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that were what? Disobedient. They didn't obey God's word. We can go take it. Who are these people that don't enter into that rest? Verse 19. And we see that they were not able to enter in because of what? Unbelief. And what we begin to see is that there's more than just hearing the voice. Like in Luke the 13th chapter. You've got to give diligence. You've got to be involved and in striving to enter into that narrow gate. But Lord, we heard you in the streets preach. In our, and, and we heard you preach. Uh, we heard the voice. But there's more to entering into heaven, which is God's rest that remains, than just hearing the voice. Because you know what? We don't have to believe it if we hear it. We can disobey it if we want to. We can transgress its requirements if we want to. And we with a heart of unbelief that starts with a heart of doubt can start tempting God. And yet they, they have heard his voice. And they understood Moses was his servant. But that is the point. I heard the sermons. I heard the preaching. I came there to support the preaching. I came there to hear, hear God's word. That doesn't mean you'll enter his rest. There's more to it than that. It's those who you're not hearing with faith. Hebrews 4.2. For indeed, as he applied to us as Christians, as he applied it to the Christians in Hebrews. For indeed, we have had good tidings preached unto us. That's the gospel. Even as also they, you're going to enter into the into the, my rest and enter the land of Canaan, which, which Joshua is going to give them. Even as also they, but the word of hearing did not profit them. Why? Because it was not united by faith to them that heard. I can hear it. He said, well, how come people don't obey it? How come people just sit there and they don't respond to it? Don't believe it because that will that will bring forth the response and just because you hear it doesn't mean that you will necessarily believe it let's go to Romans 10 why do you go to Romans 10 and verse 17 I'll tell you why I do because that tells me where faith comes from faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God or the word of Christ but did you note the context of that? Romans 10, 16 and 17. But they did not all hearken to the glad tidings. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? They heard the report. But they did not hearken in faith. They did not unite the hearing with faith. They didn't believe it. He said, well, must be something wrong with my delivery. Must be something wrong with uh, how I'm approaching it. And you can, self-criticism is good. I don't, looking at ourselves, can I approach that better? Or we get to the point, so well, I guess God's word doesn't, doesn't work today. 
because it's, it's, it's not creating a response that it is good. Well, the response is that we need to take that word. That word can create faith, Romans 10, 17. But not everybody believes what they hear from God's word. And those who enter into that rest are those who are going to add faith to that hearing. And this is the problem with the people. They did not, the hearing did not profit them because they did not unite faith with that. And that's the point that he's made. We have the glad tidings preached to us. Do we want to be in that same category? It did not profit them because it was not united by faith to them that heard. In John 5 and verse 24, there is the hearing and also the believing that takes place. Where we're supposed to, uh, uh, how, how we respond to that hearing. Verily I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth him that sent me hath eternal life and cometh not into judgment, but hath passed out of death to life. He that heareth my word and believes God. So, I know who enters into that rest. It's more than just hearing. It's going to unite with faith, but that's more than faith, too. Hebrews 4 and verse 6, we continue. Remember, the rest is still out here. Will you enter into it? And it begins to tell us who's not, and therefore we know who is. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some should enter in thereto, they to whom the glad tidings were before preached failed to enter in because of what? Disobedience. I trust you, Mr. Pilate. I believe you are wonderful, Pilate. I believe you're not on drugs. I believe you've had your sleep, but I'm not getting on your plane today. So I just believe I'm going to be the one in one millionth that's going down. And I don't, I can't get on today. And yet he said, come on, get on the plane. Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest. I believe you, Lord. I believe you're the son of God. Come follow me. And I will give you rest. I believe that, but I won't do that. You can take the land of Canaan, Israelites. I promise land to you. It's my promise. I believe you, God. But we don't obey. And the Hebrew writer says, you know what? It failed because of disobedience. So I'm going to take the opposite Will you allow me to do that? Is that a logical thing? That means, and we've already seen where, where the Hebrew writer is doing this. Hebrews, the, fourth, uh, the third chapter. They, why did they not enter? Verse 18, they were not entering the rest because of disobedience. Verse 19, they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Let's put unbelief and what's the action? Disobedience. So let's put belief. What's the action? Obedience. And that's what we see in the gospel. It's not I'm going to obey what I want to obey. I'm going to obey my way of doing things. And I will follow God according to my standard. And I will obey what I think I need to obey. No, it's the obedience of faith. Did you notice that? Look at Romans the first chapter. In Romans 1 and verse 5, this great book about being justified by faith. This is the kind of faith that we're justified by. When he says in verse 5, through whom, as he speaks about his apostleship, through whom we receive grace and apostleship, unto what go? Unto obedience of faith among all the nations for his namesake. Faith must be united with obedience to be the faith that saves. And if we say, well, I, I think he says that in chapter 1, but he really gets off of that through the book. No, he ends up with it. In Romans, the 16th chapter, the last chapter, he speaks in verse 26. 
But now it's manifested by the scriptures, the prophets, according to the commandment of eternal God. It's made unto all the nations unto obedience of faith. Verse 26. Obedience of faith. That's the faith that justifies. Can you understand what Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, and 16? Go into all the world, preach the gospel. There's the good tidings. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Oh, that's just discounting faith. No, it's where faith is able to justify us. We obey what he says to do. He that believeth and is baptized. Oh, baptism is obedience of faith. It's not works in the sense that, well, I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll, do that. I'll get these things out here and I'll be right with God. I'll put baptism in there. I won't lie, I won't cheat, I won't do this. I'll just be good. No, baptism is not like that. that it is, it's it's obedient, obeying what God said to do to come in contact with Jesus' blood and be assured of a new life in Christ. It's all about faith. Obedience of faith. And the Hebrew writer is taking us on this journey. Rest is still out here. At the same time, he's telling us who's going to enter. He's telling us who's not. We realize, no, I've got to just not only hear his voice, I've got to unite faith with that, and I have to unite the right kind of faith. Obedience of faith. Fourthly, it's those that just keep on giving diligence. That's who's going into God's rest. Look at Hebrews 4 and verse 11. Hebrews 4 and verse 11. And remember, these, these four times from Hebrews 3 and verse 15, you've got Psalm 95, verse 7. He just keeps back at it because there's instruction there. But in this process, he says in verse 11, Let us, therefore, give diligence to enter into that rest, that no man fall after the same example of disobedience. What rest is that? It's the rest that was after Joshua, the land of Canaan. What rest is that? It's the rest that is after the Sabbath rest of God. But notice how he connects us with the Sabbath rest of God. Verse 9, there remaineth therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In what way? For he that has entered into his rest hath himself also rested from his works as God did from his. I'm still living. I'm still working. You're still living. You're still working. But one day this life will be over. And we can rest from our labors. As God rested from his on the Sabbath day. On the, on the Sabbath, on the seventh day he rested. But it's not that rest that we enter. It's not a Sabbath rest. We're just... You know, not going to work anymore. But that's we're going to rest. That's part of heaven. We finish this life. But we enter into a rest of, of glory. And we want to give diligence to enter into that rest. And so we want to give diligence and not fall by the same example. What example? Psalm 95. Psalm 95, the people of Israel. They complained with no, no water. They tested. They proved God. They won in the wilderness for 40 years. They sinned and didn't not, not, were not able to go in. They, were, they died in the wilderness. They displeased God. His wrath was upon them. They did not enter into his rest prescribed for them. Do you want to fall by the same example? Again, a child of God could fall. We can be having obedience of faith, but quit being diligent to make heaven our home. That's what the first part of Hebrews 3 was about. That's what we examined this morning. Hold firm to that confidence and that boldness. And that we need to exhort one another so we'll not fall short of that rest. He said, this is how you get there. It will take diligence. That means 
to be busy. It involves being swift to do something. And what you should be swift in doing all of your life, serving God. You'll be quick to do that. I'm not going to argue with him. I'm not going to complain about it. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do what he says to do. But it takes giving diligence. Being busy. Heaven is where I'm going. That's the rest that still remains. And I can rest from my labors. And if you're following the Lord, your labors that you rest from will be a fine legacy of you you leave behind. Because you serve the Lord. Serving according to his voice. And that's the beautiful thing that we're looking at. Give diligence to enter into that. And then look at this. You think, well, that's finished, but verse 14 is where we pick up the high priesthood again. Have you ever thought why he says this? Must be some connection. Why? Why would we say it be a connection? Look at, right, says, verse 11. For the same example of disobedience, for the word of God is living and active. Why go there? For explanation. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, quick to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is no creature that is not made manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and laid open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Why go there, God? Why go there, Holy Spirit? What's connecting what we've just been talking about, the rest that still awaits us and we know who's going there and we know who's not. Why talk about the living word? And he says, for the word of God is living and active. What's the connection? It's got to be something. Sometimes we go to God's word, we'll take those verse 11, 12 out, and we talk about the power of God's word. And we'll talk about the word is living and active. And we'll preach sermons on that, and that's fine. But this week, I've been wondering, what connection does that have? What is he repeating over and over again in this section? Psalm 95, verse 7. Who wrote it? David did. By whose help? Chapter 3, the Holy Spirit saith it. It's God's word. And that word that was written by David centuries ago, he just brings it right in to the Hebrew people that are Christians. You going to fall by the same example? That word is dead, isn't it? That's about then. I want to know about now. The word of God is now. And what has been the problem in Psalm 95? They had a heart problem. Their heart was hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Their heart did not receive the message and say, well, they didn't unite it with faith. They didn't obey. Are you going to fall after the same example of disobedience? Where do we get it? God's word. That's why he brings in God's living word. It is quick to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. We've just seen it exemplified. Where? In God's word. For the people of Israel. Man hasn't changed. His heart can still be filled with doubts. His heart cannot, can be one that's not going to believe. And that disbelief is not going to work into obedience. It'll be disobedience. And what we begin to realize is that this word is to be honored. And it is something that we see its characteristics of. That indeed it's sharper than any two-edged sword. What we do this sword? Let's follow it. Let's start piercing it in to a body and then see how far we go. To the dividing of soul and spirit, 
And that's very difficult to do. But in this part, of both joints and marrow. Are you going to cut the joints before you get to the marrow? Probably. Bone marrow, that's inside bone. Piercing right on through. And it is so sharp that it can divide both soul and spirit, both joints and marrows. And it's quick to discern. That means to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. I think that's where he really brings it home. He's condemning this heart problem of the people of God in Israel's time. And says, you know what? That word is living and active and boom, it fits you too. And what I'm saying tonight, in the first century, that same word can come over and boom, hit me and hit you. Paul thanked God in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 that those Thessalonians, when they received the message, we got a message here. They got a historical background. They received the message. You did not receive it as the message as it's from man, but as it is in truth from God that worketh in you that believe. That's why we go to God's word. I'm strengthened by God's word. It's not a dead letter. It's not hampered by time. It's appropriate for each generation. And he has been exonerating God's word, making that application to their life. And we come along, and if we're giving diligence to enter into that rest, we realize it's going to take more than hearing. It's going to take more than faith. It's going to take obedience of faith and giving diligence to hold on. Because the rest was not Canaan. The rest was not believing God, you're my creator, and I'm in your rest. It's not the Sabbath rest. There remaineth a Sabbath rest for the people of God. We'll get to rest from our labors. But those labors will be giving diligence to enter into the rest that remains. And you know what? We'll be panting for God's word. And we'll be seeking Jesus through his sacred page. Just like we sung this evening. And the more we get involved with that word, the more we'll see God. We'll see his faithfulness. And we'll say, God, I don't want to leave your promise left undone in my life. And that's where we leave it with you tonight. Wouldn't it be sad that he's promised you heaven? He's told you the way is Christ. The way we react to Jesus' message is obedience of faith. He that believeth that is baptized shall be saved. Wouldn't it be sad to this wonderful plan that you miss out on it and I miss out on it? Don't do that. The opportunity is given you tonight to obey that gospel. He that believeth that is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieveth shall be condemned. Let's be a believer and then be a diligent liver and we'll enter into that rest as promised us of God. You need to respond to the invitation. We're here to help you. Come now as we stand and sing.